I'm Dave Tuttle, Postdoctoral Research Fellow in the Energy Institute. Welcome to another ET Energy Symposium. Uh, we have the pleasure of having Bert Haskell here, who's the Chief Technology Officer of the Pecan Street Research Consortium. And Bert's been associated with Pecan Street for at least eight or nine years. I think that ever since its inception, he's been the CEO. I recall him from the meetings being in the formative stages in 08, 09. And he's part of their success. He's a wonderful contributor to the effort and nice to work with too. His presentation today will be distributed energy resources driving multidiscipline innovation. And Bert has an interesting background, always in technology. Um, he's worked in technology since he, I guess he got out of school in 84 with Eastman Kodak. Worked for five years in electronics manufacturing process, and that was while he was finishing up his master's degree at University of Rochester. Then he worked for one of the organizations that helped propel further Austin into the high-tech arena, Microelectronics Computer Corporation, Technology Corporation, MCC. And he concluded that tenure as a vice president of electronics product research. And since then, he's been going to different uh, firms, all very interesting. Stellar Display, I guess that's Mark Eaton. Oh, yeah. Wireless Age, Motion Computing, Portelligent, and most recently, Heliovolt, prior to his stint for the last near decade at Pecan Street. Uh, and in Heliovolt, he was the director of product development for SIGS-based thin film photovoltaic modules. So welcome, Bert. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you for coming. Okay, thank, thank you, Dave. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Uh, how many of you are, are, the title has a, a bunch of parts. How many of you are here for distributed energy uh, part of the title? What, what uh, if you could raise your hand. Okay, how many of you are in the multidiscipline part of the title? <laughs> and how many are here in the innovation part of the title? Okay, interesting. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and blend all those together. I, I, uh, I get to talk a lot about various things that we're working on, and uh, so I'll let you guide me. I, I brought a few pictures to, to help me uh, uh, to show you what we're doing and to get in the right frame of mind about what I, what I can talk about, but I'll, I'll certainly be happy to, uh, you know, answer any questions as we go, so don't hesitate to raise your hand or, or interject. Um, I'll just start off by showing you, this is our lab uh, over in East Austin, it's in the Miller neighborhood. This is the first floor of the lab where we work uh, every day. Uh, right, this is my computer right here. I'm looking at some uh, energy data and we sit around this uh, table and uh, this is during the Olympics, so I think we were watching a, uh, an Olympics uh, football match. and. We, uh, we write proposals and we uh, work on projects. We analyze data uh, in this uh, area. And then we've got a, a lab I'll show you on the, uh, the second floor of our building that, uh, where, we do, where we have our data center. But anyway, Pecan Street has been around since 2010. And we uh, got our initial funding from the Department of Energy. We've got too much gain on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, and we got started with uh, a DOE grant that funded us to go do residential energy measurements. And this was before the term uh, IoT came out. So uh, Internet of Things was just be becoming, getting to be coined as a term. Um, but it turned out that that task that we had been given was in fact a really interesting and valuable application of Internet of Things technology. And essentially what we did was we spent the first couple of years figuring out the most cost-effective way to get a lot of rich uh, energy data out of a residential dwelling. And so what we did was we ended up with a solution. There were a lot of things available. There were plug monitors that you could put in the plug, uh, in, put in the outlet, and you could plug everything in through one of those and then that would report data back and it, it had the additional benefit of giving the customer remote control over that, the power supply for that device. That was one option. There were other options where you would just put a CT clamp around the incoming power line and read the whole home energy. 
the other option was to get the utility to give you the smart meter data that they were collecting. And what we ended up with was uh, a device that we actually put in every circuit panel in the home and it, it was somewhat costly, more costly than some of the other options. And it also had a, a two hour, one to two hour installation by an electrician, which was also costly. But uh, we decided to go ahead and do that and it was a great decision, lucky, but a, a good decision because we had really good data, really high quality data, uh, very granular data. We were measuring every circuit in the home, we were measuring it on one minute intervals, we were getting voltage, current, and uh, phase. So uh, that, was, that was how we got started. And uh, at that time, we really didn't have a whole lot of expertise. I was the only technologist in the, in the company. But uh, we, and we had, uh, actually in this building, we had the folks uh, at TAC that were taking a lot of our data and doing uh, data visualization in the Viz Lab right down the hall here. And uh, what we quickly realized was if we were going to really exploit this opportunity, we needed to broaden our uh, technical depth. And uh, one thing that became very clear was we, we needed much more control over the, the data that we were collecting. Uh, the, the TAC folks were, you know, excellent at handling large amounts of data, but we really needed to understand that full process to maintain the quality, to do all the, the uh, data cleansing that's required and the, uh, uh, the, the, the archiving of the data and the curation. The curation of the data is really critical. So uh, that was our first area where we really started to uh, build our technical competency. We hired some uh, very good uh, data base and, and software people to do that. And um, then we uh, proceeded to uh, uh, start to go after additional sources of funding from, from corporate sources. And what uh, some of those corporations wanted us to do was to collect even more granular data. They wanted one second data. And they wanted us to do field trials in these homes that we had for uh, data collection, try, trying out new energy-related products, proving that these products would save energy or proving that we could adjust the lifestyle of people to uh, be more energy efficient. And a lot of those tests proved that that's not, that's really a lot harder to do than people think. But it caused us to uh, increase our competency significantly. In order to collect that one second data, the devices that we were using, uh, they had to buffer all of the, uh, they, they, they could only, they could store about a year of data, which was great, at one minute. And uh, that's important for reliability because we're, we're collecting all the data through the consumer broadband connection. But uh, to get one second data, there wasn't enough memory. It, could, it would accumulate about uh, maybe a couple of hours of that and then uh, the system, the memory would be full. So we had to build our own gateway. So we had, well, and we didn't know it at the time, it was an IoT gateway. And so we put this IoT gateway in the house and that would talk to our device over power line communication. It would store much more data and then that would free our collection device to uh, you know overwrite the storage and continue to collect but we were still accumulating all the data and keep and you have to accumulate it where you collect it because if your internet connection breaks down then your your data stream your data integrity falls apart so that was the next step in the evolution and then uh, to to uh, make those devices, we were buying cases, but we realized we needed to customize it. We need special antennas. We needed additional circuit boards in the box. So we got 3D printer and started printing our own boxes. And uh, we were using Raspberry Pis and Arduinos to build uh, more complex things. We started building our own sensor packages, uh, pressure and temperature and uh, uh, motion detection, those kind of things to support different projects. And uh, before we knew it, we were, we were building products in the lab and building this really uh, huge uh, database. So uh, that's kind of what got us, got us into this business of, of, and got us where we are today. So I'll show you a few things, uh, some of our capabilities. Like, so one of them, uh, this is one of the first things we bought. We don't use it that much anymore, but this was just a laser, two-dimensional laser cutting machine that we use for a few projects uh, to make some uh, parts. That's on our, in our third floor lab. Um, this is our second floor lab. So here, uh, 
we've got back in this corner here is our uh, residential database. This is about uh, 10 terabytes of residential energy data. So it's the world's largest residential energy database. It sits right there. All the data flows directly over the internet from the homes with our instrumentation into this server. And then we back it up on the cloud. But one thing that's really important in this type of research, again, getting back to that control that you have to have over your data, is you don't want this data going to some third party uh, server farm off site before it comes to you. Um, you have to have, you, you almost have to have physical possession of the data. It sounds kind of strange, but uh, without that physical access, uh, this is our core business. So uh, we have to be able to do that. Uh, anyway, about this time that, that we're, we're starting to put this lab together, and we've been in this building about three years now, uh, we started to increase our uh, technical expertise. Uh, the first thing we did, even uh, we, we hired a really great uh, electrical engineer, Scott Henson, and he was in the previous shot sitting at the table there. Uh, Scott uh, is a really great power engineer, and um, he designed this lab, and then uh, he's also given us the ability to do a lot of, uh, uh, develop a lot of uh, power engineering systems. And so I'll show you something that he's built here. Just while I'm on this picture, I'll show you also this is our 3D printer in the back of the lab. And then this is where Grant Fisher usually sits. And then these are all, he's the data director and then all the other data analysts uh, sit around here. So we do have a fair amount, a fair number of people that are, that are analyzing data and writing software. So one of, the, one of the other things we did fairly early that expanded our capability is we hired an app developer because with all this data, we, uh, we realized that the, the best way to, to do something or to, to take advantage of it was we had to make it presentable to the residential homeowners in the form of a mobile app. So to date, we've built probably half a dozen different types of apps. Uh, we have one... Uh, that just shows people what their residential energy usage is. And we've done a lot of studies to figure out if having that information really helps people save energy. And as, it turned, as you might expect, what we found is that average to upper income people uh, find, it, they find it interesting for a couple of weeks, but it doesn't really change their behavior. But lower income people uh, do pay attention to that because their electricity bill is a you know, a sizable percentage of their income. And so they are interested in saving even just a few dollars a week if, uh, if, they, can find, if they can learn something from that mobile app. So we had one guy that uh, we went over to uh, fix his uh, gateway, his IoT gateway that was sending data to us, and uh, we thought something was broken because he had this, uh, you know, three, three kilowatt load that was always on, and it turned out he always left his oven on. Uh, because he didn't, when he wanted to cook something, he didn't want to wait for the oven to warm up. But he had no idea. Uh, I, he might have been doing something else with the oven. I don't know. But he, <laughs> but it, but that's what he said, and he had no idea how much it was costing him. Obviously, it was just very expensive. So that's you know that's one example where it was helpful. Uh, but we have a lot of examples like that of uh, where people being presented with either energy or water or gas data. Uh, leads to some kind of insight. Uh, we've got another mobile app called Sol, which monitors people's solar production. And then uh, we can tell if their solar panels aren't working correctly, uh, just because the output will not, will sh shift uh, from what it should be. And we can do that. We can compare it to all the other houses in the same zip code. We can, that tells us what the solar irradiance was uh, on that particular day. And therefore, if that house deviates differently than the, you know, lower than the, the rest of the samples in that population, you know there's something wrong with the solar panel. And you can actually uh, take a pretty good guess at what the, what the failure mode or the degradation mode might be and advise the, cu advise the customer through the app what's going on. So that, that's another app. And then most recently, uh, we've started doing a lot of water and gas work and we have a, a mobile app for water usage, which, amongst other things, can help people uh, realize how expensive it really is to water your lawn. Uh, and we can also uh, 
indicate whether they might have a leak, particularly an undetected leak, like under the foundation or something like that, which can be very expensive. Uh, people uh, usually don't find out about those until they get a, a $10,000 water bill one month, and then they realize they've got a, a massive leak uh, under their house. So uh, those, you know, those kind of applications are, are very valuable, and it's, a, it's one of the first places where IoT, so to speak, has some real tangible uh, commercial benefit. So let me, uh, let me talk a little bit more about some of the, the devices. I, I mentioned the apps because the apps kind of give you an idea of what, what's motivating us. Uh, I'll just show you this. So this is our 3D printer. Uh, inside it here you see we're printing the housing for some blue cubes. And this is, uh, this is a valuable capability because it reduces our cycle time to try out a new process. Normally to get a custom housing like this you'd have to, you know, you could, you could have it prototyped in a prototype shop, you know, handcrafted. That would be very expensive and would take some time. You can also have an injection molded. Uh, but with this, in this way we can spit out a new iteration of this every couple hours. And so if we've got, you know, if we have the antenna port in the wrong place or we need to adjust it slightly, it's, it's trivial to just move it over. So we're able to very rapidly prototype uh, different devices with this. So what that's led to, in addition to just these IoT gateways that we've been making now for a couple of years for a lot of different applications, we have made, uh, well, let me show you that. So this is what it looks like with the electronics. And... Uh, We've got, we can plug all different kinds of radios into this. Uh, we can put different antennas on it depending on the frequency of the radio. Our typical gateway, if it's fully, fully populated, w uh, can read uh, any kind of uh, IRT-based utility meter, so water, gas, and electric. It could read that not only from your house, but probably uh, your neighbors in three or four houses in every direction. So uh, we can collect that data. Uh, the other thing we can do is talk over power line communication to our energy monitoring system that's installed in the circuit panel. Uh, we could talk directly to a Nest thermostat uh, through one of these devices or any, pretty much any automated uh, smart thermostat we can talk to. And then we can also talk to special sensors and devices that we have designed and built. And so an example of that, which is this is becoming a big activity now for us, is this uh, water meter. Uh, and so this is, we call this blue band. And this is, what happens is this uh, band here uh, just snaps over the top of a water meter register and allows us with a uh, Hall effect sensor to read the magnet that's turning inside that water meter. So if you don't know about water meters, uh, it's old technologies, I think, that, uh, but it's really cool. They, they, uh, it's a positive displacement water meter. There's a, a, fan, a little uh, blade or a turbine blade, whatever you want to call it, inside there that's being pushed by the water, and it's rotating, and it's measuring the volume, and there's a magnet on that. And then the water meter housing itself is fully contained. It's a solid, uh, solid metal surface, with, uh, and it's, it's fully sealed. And so obviously you don't want water meters to leak, but you need to get that information out. So that magnet turns, this is like an 1890s pag, uh, patent, that, that magnet turns and then you snap a register on top with some gearing and uh, some dials, and that's your meter. And, and some little uh, digits that sit there and turn, you know, t with uh, different significant digits. And the magnet couples to that system through the, through the metal body, the brass body of the water meter, and that's how you get your water meter. They've been doing it forever. And so what happens now is if you want to upgrade, if you want to get more data, if you want to uh, modernize your water utility and not have to send people around to read the meters, and then if you want more frequent, you know, every minute or every hour or whatever, uh, you need to pay the meter companies, you know, several hundred dollars to, to change that, and then you have to teach your meter readers to read a different type of meter. Well, what we figured out, uh, we run the Texas Municipal Water Consortium, we figured out how to read a, a legacy meter without 
having to replace it. Because, and that's a big cost as well, having to swap the meter out, take it out of the ground, put a new one in, turn the people's water off. Uh, very uh, time consuming. So we can just snap this over the top of the meter and read that rotation. And we can get down to about two ounce accuracy and we can read it as often, as we can go down to one second if we want, but we typically will collect one minute data here. So this is kind of a, a, a breakthrough. We've got a huge amount of interest in this, uh, a lot less expensive, and uh, we've coupled this now with a new type of irrigation control system. So we've got you know, some mechanical engineering going on here, and by the way, I'll say this was, this was kind of a cool project from a mechanical engineering standpoint, which is what I did a lot of in my early career. Um, this is a, a prototype version that's molded with black plastic right here. And then the band in this case is blue, and this is the water meter, and this is the register. So we snapped over the register. The reason this band is detachable, by the way, is every meter is shaped differently, so we have to know the meter model number. But if we know that, we can 3D print a band that will fit that particular meter. We snap it on the, the body here, and we've, we're able to customize it for any meter. But one of the most difficult problems was making this all waterproof. We found out the hard way that 3D printed plastic is porous. And so this is down in a meter pit, and the meter pit fills up with water, and then our electronics are, are surrounded by water, and uh, it stops working. So we did quite a bit of engineering to, to get gaskets around this. Uh, we've got a, a special gasket, in, gasket feed through here so we can get the uh, signals out here to this connector, which then uh, is a waterproof, standard waterproof connector that can plug into a radio module with its own battery, and that will transmit uh, whatever radio ty type of radio signal or protocol that we want to talk to our gateway or to a local collector or to a utility collector. So we, we have flexibility on how we talk out of this. But making this waterproof uh, enclosure was, you know, that's a skill set we had to develop uh, in terms of the design and the uh, gasketing and, and all those things and getting and the, the molding capabilities. So that was kind of fun. And so now we're, we're able to uh, make these and sell them. Most of the applications right now are for utility-driven research where they're trying to understand water conservation uh, effectiveness and those types of things. But uh, there's also a lot of interest now in using these for leak detection. Uh, that's another picture, same thing. Okay, uh, what is this? That's one of the radio modules, and we actually buy that. That's made by a, a, a meter manufacturer. So uh, another capability we have is this. This uh, actually, we can design our own circuits and then this uh, draws the circuits with a polymer ink. And then we, if we have the parts, we can order the parts, get those quickly delivered. We can make our own, uh, let's say, one or two layer circuit boards with this technology. And this is really great for rapid prototyping. Although uh, there's a great resource out there in the industry for getting quick turn circuits. And I will say these circuits don't work very well. Uh, people have been trying to make polymer, you know, rapid print circuits for this type of application for a long time, and the material science just isn't there. Uh, these, uh, these polymer conductors are, always end up being brittle. They're not very solderable. Solder can actually leach all the metal out of the polymer and, and make them non-conductive. So uh, we struggle with this a little bit, but it, it has it's proven useful. But nine times out of ten, we'll actually just go ahead and order a circuit board from a quick turn circuit shop. But you know, if, if something like this really worked, man, that, that would be a great tool. Um, anyway, here's something that does really work. This is an energy switch uh, that we've been developing now with uh, funding from the DOE. So this gets back into our power uh, engineering capabilities. Uh, and this is, this, is an inter this is a thing on the internet. I showed you a small thing. This is a big thing that, that uh, is an IoT device, essentially. And it's IoT because uh, it, can, it has the capacity to, to communicate with all kinds of entities and in a very beneficial way. So in a, 
in its basic functionality, uh, this is an energy storage system. And if you look down here in the bottom of the rack, there's three uh, rack-mounted boxes that are designed to fit into a 19-inch rack, very standard. And they are packed full of lithium-ion cells manufactured by LG Electronics. And so this is a form factor that they are currently designing. And if you go to one of their utility scale uh, containers that are full of batteries for you know, wind generation, storage, those kind of applications, they'll still have racks and racks of these same uh, modules inside there. But we're just building a, a small version for a, a single home. And so we've got 9.6 kilowatt hours total of uh, energy storage. And then as we move up the system here, we've got a, an automated load monitoring and control system. And I told you we, we bought uh, a device uh, for our initial energy research from another company, eGage, uh, to collect that. But in this, for this equipment, we designed our own because we need to not only monitor the energy uh, flowing through the house, but we need to actually have control over it. So we've got all the switches in here. And so when this gets installed, this box, here's another one right here, uh, this box gets rolled into the garage next to the circuit panel. We re reroute the entire circuit panel of the house into uh, this switching network and then back out to the, the various circuits. And so now we can see where all the power is going and we can control the home at, at the circuit level. So that adds a fair amount of expense both on the installation side and on the hardware. As you can see, it's a lot of hardware and there's only so much you can do to reduce the size of that because there's so much power flowing through it and uh, you get into thermal issues if you get much, too, much smaller than what we have here. So, uh, you know, we're looking at how, how, can we, how can we modularize this and take it out of this box and make it something that's fully compatible with a residential circuit panel. So, uh, if we move up the system here, then uh, actually on this side, we've got, this is the heart of it. It's what we call the SARM. And this is more, this is not so much electrical engineering, this is just more uh, software and embedded systems expertise that is required here. And so here, this is where uh, our electrical engineer and our data scientist slash software guy uh, collaborate to make something that's really, um, really unique. And this, uh, what we call the SARM module, switch automation relay module, this is what keeps track of everything that's going on in here. It's being fed with all the measurements. It's making sure that uh, we, don't, that, that we don't set this thing on fire. It's making sure that nothing, uh, that every, all the rated components aren't going to be subjected to uh, current or voltage levels that are beyond their rating. And uh, it has an API on top of it so that it can be controlled either through this control display unit, which is at, when that door is closed, uh, that will be just a display on the front of the box. And so you, that's where you can control this. And uh, this, is, this is an example where you don't want to give the customer a lot of control over the device. Uh, so we've got a very limited set of functions, and they, we express them in terms of modes. So we've got two on-grid modes and two off-grid modes. The on-grid modes, uh, one of them uh, allows the customer, and by the way, you, pl you plug your solar panels right into this. You plug your backup generator into this, your grid connection, and as I said, your residential loads. And so what happens is uh, in, one, in the mode one, uh, you can use your solar uh, energy. You can charge your batteries uh, with your solar energy if you're, if you're not using it. You can charge your batteries with the uh, energy from the grid. Uh, if you don't have solar or batteries, you can run your house off the grid. That's great. That's what you would expect. Um, what, but what won't happen is you won't put any energy back on the grid. And that's really critical. Um, a lot, this is something that's emerging now, and it's a big issue because a lot of utilities are rejecting people's solar applications because they say, well, we've got too much energy on our grid. And so that, in some cases, that's that's actually true. In some cases, they just don't want to deal with the, the revenue consequences of that, uh, uh, that reality. But uh, with a system like this, th they can no longer have that objection because this system guarantees that there will not be any uh, energy pushed back onto the grid. In addition, we're, we're able to guarantee that the power factor that the utility sees is very good, but better than 0.95. 
and it also maintains power factor for the home. And the reason it does that is because there's two inverters, two uh, Schneider electric inverters in the system right here. So essentially what this is is a, a residential microgrid uh, pre-engineered in a box and uh, you can roll it into a house and it, it can basically, you've got the first mode, then the second mode is full transactive energy, energy flowing on the grid, off the grid as the customer desires. It can be put under utility control um, or it can be controlled by a third party or the customer can retain control of it uh, themselves. And then we've also got two off-grid modes and the off-grid mode means that you're no longer connected to the grid. You're running your house off of your own energy if, if your solar and batteries are large enough to do that. And if they're not large enough, then the load management system will allow you to in institute a policy that will extend uh, the length of time over which you're able to uh, operate off-grid. Okay, I talked about that too much. Um, so anyway, that's, uh, that's kind of what we're doing at Pecan Street. I think that's all. Let me see if this picture. Yeah, that's just another view. You can see the, this is a, another energy switch. This one is now in a house in Miller. And uh, so is this one. And then one of these is going to get sent out to NREL next week uh, to be tested. Okay, do you have any questions? Yes. I definitely need the microphone, sorry. Um, name? Margaret Cook, civil engineering. Um, does your system that you were just talking about have the ability to incorporate time of use pricing if that were to come into play in Austin? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what the way, so in this system, uh, what we've architected this with an API that can uh, allow uh, an outside entity with an IP connection to switch modes. So that could be your smartphone, it could be a third party uh, advisory service, it could be the utility itself. But uh, with the right credentials you can go in and you can, uh, dis you can send the system parameters to tell the battery when to charge and discharge. And then that way you're able to take, uh, take advantage of uh, time of use pricing or other types of pricing uh, schemes. Yeah. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Yeah, did, well, why don't you repeat the question now that you have a microphone? Um, was, did you guys have any trouble convincing people to be, uh, homeowners to become a part of the project? Um, any like privacy or security concerns? Uh, no, we didn't. And the reason is that we, uh, we presented them with an agreement. First of all, I mean, the, when we first got started, the response in this particular neighborhood was really overwhelming and that's important when uh, we help other communities do this now but finding the right community is essential but people were really interested and uh, I don't we rarely if ever heard any privacy concerns now that may be because we handed them an agreement that addressed that and they had no they didn't have any concerns I don't know if they were if they were concerned about it and those concerns were allayed or if they were never concerned about it but we have a policy where uh, when they sign up uh, all of their data is stored on our servers without any of their personal information. And, and that personal information is linked to a project number uh, and that's kept on a separate non-internet connected PC and a couple of our customer service people are the only people that have uh, access to that for customer service purposes. Um, so I, you know, I, I we see some interesting stuff, but I, there's no way for me to find out who, who it is, and I, I don't care, obviously. But you're right, that, that is a concern, but it's, it's relatively easily addressed. And, uh, yeah. Uh, so now that you have all these... Uh... So now that you have all these uh, analytics, uh, what do you see as some of the top entrepreneurial opportunities in the space of uh, electrical, water, gas monitoring, and distributed generation. Right. Well, the, I'll t so two answers. The first one is not what everybody thought. Uh, everybody thought 
that there was some kind of uh, economic opportunity to modify people's behavior uh, to cause them to use less energy. And uh, that's putting the cart before the horse um, because that's, all, that's, that's totally driven. You know, nobody's going to uh, sit in a hot living room without their AC running to make their utility more profitable. No one's interested in that. Um, people will, will get to the point where they will become more energy efficient if, if it becomes part of their e equation around building self-sufficiency. In other words, if they say, you know, I could live off grid and I might have to cut back my air conditioning once in a while, but I'd never have a power bill and they'd never be able to turn it off, even if I, you know, if I didn't have an income and couldn't pay my bill, couldn't do anything about it. That's a whole different equation. But just, you know, the, the initial thought didn't pan out and we recognize that quickly. The, the immediate opportunity is in diagnostics, telling people that something's wrong, something is dangerous, something is about to break. That's where the, the, the potential is and that we're, we're starting to see a lot of opportunities from outside companies coming to us asking them to help figure out how to do that. Could you talk a little bit about how the microgrid system you showed compares to Tesla's power pack that they're trying to put on houses, the functionality of those two? Yeah, the power wall is uh, that, you know, they keep upgrading the specs whenever they get criticized. <laughs> but uh, I think they, you know, last I saw maybe it was a seven kilowatt hour with like two, two to three kilowatt peak output, something like that. Um, the difference is uh, a couple of them. One, first of all, that's a surprisingly big unit. Um, if they, sh they show pictures of it, but they don't show a person standing next to it. It's like if it was on this wall, it would kind of take up most of that wall. It's, it's, a, it's a giant thing, um, and, which is fine. Ours is big too, but it doesn't have the inverters in it. It doesn't have load management. It doesn't have power factor correction. It, it's really designed to just shift, basically peak shift, uh, you know, or peak leveling uh, within the home for relatively low amounts of power. Probably not a bad product in a climate, a, a mild climate, Southern California or somewhere where you don't have a heavy air conditioning load and where maybe you're not charging your EV uh, with the system. But if you have a, the kind of power loads we have around here, you would need probably two or three of them to be effective. And then you need a lot more hardware and a professional engineer to design the system so you could take advantage of it. Any other questions? Um, so far, what have been the observed uh, trends of inefficient energy usage commonly? Uh, well, you know, it, again, that's, uh, we, we don't pay that much attention to that, uh, you know, because uh, it is what it is. Uh, you know, is it inefficient to run, to run your air conditioner so that you're comfortable? It just, it, it depends on your house. I mean, we, we can, we've done some early studies back when we first got started that showed that Surprise, surprise, a home that's been retrofitted to be energy efficient uses 30% less energy than a home that isn't. And so, and the things they do are, you know, seal the windows, put in better insulation, get a new air conditioner that has a better, that runs more efficiently. So, you know, it's the usual, the list of things to do hasn't changed because of this data. This data does help verify it. Um, where, where we started to get a little more, uh, it started to get more interesting was we did a study uh, a pri we did a mock pricing trial, except we figured out a way to make it economically valid. And we, we set up a system to uh, see if we could, through pricing, get people to change when they uh, charge their electric vehicles. And we, we demonstrated that you can definitely do that with pricing. But it has to be actually, well, there, it's kind of bimodal. You can, the pricing that we found uh, was the pricing differential had to be pretty high. It was like 60 cents versus 2 cents per kilowatt hour. 
that at first we thought that was changing it until we realized that other people in the neighborhood were changing their charging patterns just because they heard their neighbors were doing it. So we, it was kind of an interesting study. But uh, efficiency is, uh, you know, LEDs I think are probably the biggest thing right now, the, the biggest uh, new thing uh, to impact efficiency. Uh, and that's where we see, you know, they, they're paying, the payback on LED lighting is, you know, decreasing constantly. Thank you. This is good. One back there. Hey, Bert. Hey, how uh, are you doing? Good. Is that you, John? It is, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> nice beard. <laughs> um, so you just mentioned the behavioral aspect. Have you all, have you all gained any, you know, insightful uh, knowledge from the behavioral aspects of whether it's energy efficiency or, or, solar, or solar power use, um, you know, anything from kind of peer pressure to just, uh, you know, general adoption. I mean, I know it's a, it's a different kind of Petri dish over there in the, in the Mueller neighborhood specifically, but right. any, anything that maybe isn't uh, common sense um, that you've seen from, you know, different behavior? Well, I mean, one thing, okay, yeah, there's, there's some counterintuitive findings for sure. Uh, people that get solar panels use more energy than they did when they didn't have solar panels. That's just a fact. And especially if they bought an electric vehicle <laughs> to go with it. But they spend a lot less on gas. Um, so those are, you know, those are probably the, some of the, the biggest things that we found. But, you know, the, the distributed energy and electric, electrified transportation is our causing lifestyle shifts that we're, the only way we're going to find out what those are is to just do it. It's too, you can't really predict it. The dynamics are, are really strange. But I, you know, what I think is happening is we're going to end up using a lot more energy than we ever used to. It'll, the things, the lights will be more efficient, everything will be more efficient, but we'll, on, on the whole we will use more energy. And where are we going to get that energy? We're, you know, it's going to be mostly solar. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. go ahead. Do you think there's either a market that currently exists or a market that could exist in the future for demand response technologies uh, to go along with, um, with the development of localized microgrids or helping people go off the grid? Uh, like for instance, do you think that there could be a market for smart water heaters that heat up water at different points during the day in different houses that are connected to the internet together? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there is. Uh, you know, in, in some countries and regions, like I, I know in New Zealand, uh, controlling water heaters is a, a big business. It's, it's, uh, it's everywhere. It's kind of pervasive. And in fact, the utilities there actually trade futures on water heater control with each other. Um, so that, I mean, that's valid. Uh, I, that, that actually might be something that would go away in the future, or people might do it. Uh, I think a lot of this stuff is going to happen locally. And then, uh, you know, if you've got a bunch of microgrids, uh, connected together, and let's say you've got a distribution utility servicing them, then the distribution utility is going to just be querying those microgrids on their net resources. It's not going to want to. It's not going to go in there and tweak their water heater or their air conditioner or their vehicle charging. It's just going to say, what can, what load can you drop, or how much energy can you give me, or can you go off grid, or something like that. And it's going to be a, a much simpler conversation because you're going to have a lot more intelligence out at the edge. But yeah, you know, water, heating water is, is a great thing. Pumping water is a, a great energy storage option. Um, so I, I, I like to think of things like that more as energy storage rather than demand response. Could you talk a little bit about the energy switch in terms of its benefits or limitations um, for resilience? So if some, con some con customers have opted in to have the utility control their system and the power goes out. Are they at a disadvantage th for those who chose to cut themselves off from the system before it happen happened? Right. Um, that's a great question. The, the, uh, the, energy, uh, the energy switch, the whole concept that drove us to do it was, in fact, resiliency. 
And we, we made the observation that there's a million and a half natural gas or diesel backup generators deployed in residences around the U.S. In fact, now it's probably closer to two and a half million. And it's, you know, people that live in hurricane zones or other areas where their power has been interrupted. It's an experience that people don't want to relive. And so they spend $8,000 or more to have a natural gas generator installed. And there's no ROI. You know, there's no, per kilo, there's no kilowatt hour payback on that, except when you lose power and now you don't have to move out of your house and live in a hotel and, you know, trash all your food and whatever, whatever damage results from not having air conditioning. So um, resilience is a huge part of this. And uh, the, the ability for people to choose personal resilience over uh, being a good grid citizen is a huge uh, aspect of getting people to adopt it. And then once they feel secure that they have the choice, you will get some people that will uh, be willing to contribute some, you know, trade some resiliency for some economic benefit from the utility. Thank you. Was there someone over here? Yeah. So, because everybody's roof is not aligned for solar, would you have, uh, or is it just in the software? If they did a community solar garden, that virtual net metering, is that part of your system? Or? Um, it's that's not, that's not something we. Yeah, that's not something we specifically work on. But you know, this, for example, this kind of. Uh, control system and storage system could be, I would, you'd probably scale it up if you had a community, let's say you had a community solar array that was doing 200 kilowatts um, to, to help feed, you know, power to people that didn't have enough solar. You, you, part of that community, that facility would be something like this that stores energy and do, makes management decisions uh, to, you know, parcel that energy out to the to the different members of that microgrid community. Yeah. So speaking of, to the economics of this, um, I think you called it a load management system. Um, yes. How, I mean, obviously it's a prototype, so I'm sure it was very expensive to build, um, and that would be obviously reduced through economies of scale, but how would you ever find a way to make this economically viable? I know that obviously, like, Utilities have rebate programs where you can do demand management for air conditionings, for, extent, for example, and this could be kind of a larger extent to that for a home-wide um, demand management. But is there ever going to be like an economic feasibility where there's enough money in there, there's enough savings to pay for what I presume to be a rather expensive system? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Okay. And, and uh, it, uh, the factors that affect that, A, uh, some people would will already pay for it because of resiliency, mm -hmm. right? So that's, that's a small part of the market. Uh, as, the, as the cost of the system comes down, more and more people will buy it for resiliency. At a certain point, they'll even buy it just because it just saves them money outright on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, right now, there's probably about, I think there's about $40,000 worth of hardware inside that. that. And that doesn't even count the labor to put it together. but. Uh, we're, you know, if we had to build 10 more, we can, we already know how we could get that down to probably 20,000. And if we had to build 50 more, uh, I think we could get it down to below 15. If we had to build, you know, 5,000 of them, we, we could get it down to probably, you know, under $10,000. And then when you, if, if you get it adopted on a massive scale, it, it, you know, it will, it'll ultimately be below $5,000. The, the, the other variable there is how much storage is in it. Uh, someday there'll be a $5,000 version of this, and it'll have about four times as much storage as this has in it. So just think of a PC in, you know, 1985, and then what happened from there. Uh, right now, the, each one of those uh, LG modules is 3.2 kilowatt hours, so, and there's three of them, so the total is 9.6 kilowatt hours. 
So it seems like you made a really cool piece of tech. Um, but I guess I'm still confused how it really fits the same resiliency market that we talk about with like a gas generator on site. Because so your 10 kilowatt hours of storage lasts a day. Right. Um, as opposed to a week or a month or right. whatever the sort of you know, apocalyptic scenarios people are having in the Gulf for right. the storage. Well, so, it, it la so several ways. That's a great question. I, I like that question because uh, let me answer it a, a few different ways. Let's, let's take the situation where your neighbor has a natural gas generator and you have one of these. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, if the natural gas supply breaks, that neighbor's done. Yep, for sure. Um, even if it's a diesel generator and nobody wants to drive diesel out to that person's house or it can't be gotten, that person's done. You, uh, you might only be able to operate for six hours a day, but you can do it every day mm -hmm. as long as there's sun. Sure. Um, if there's cloud cover, maybe you can only go for three. So that's, you know, th th it actually has a different but equally interesting resiliency profile. The other thing is we do have a plug-in here for a natural gas generator. So let's say you're hell-bent on uh, keeping everything running. Uh, now you can have the natural gas generator plus the additional resiliency plus if you don't want to pay for the, because natural gas generators are expensive to run, if you don't want to pay for the fuel, you can get you know, many hours a day just off the solar and batteries. So then the, the generator becomes a backup to this system. Okay. So, Very cool. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, price is going down 15% per year, um, and I, that, that'll continue for quite a while. Uh, energy storage is like one of the most, uh, it's, it, it's been slow, it's, it's a hard thing to do, improving energy storage technology, it's very hard to do, but uh, it's, still, uh, it's still subject to the laws of learning curves, and what's ha what happened was, uh, it got adopted for cell phones and notebook computers back in the 90s. And it, it, uh, that industry, uh, you know, every time they doubled the volume, the cumulative volume produced, the, t the cost of the technology dropped, you know, 25, 30 percent. So it had a 0.6 coefficient learning curve every, with every cumulative doubling of volume. Well, what electric vehicles have done is one electric vehicle is like a thousand notebook computers in terms of cumulative volume. So now that, that uh, it sort of leveled off for computers because the cumulative volume stopped doubling because you can only make so many a year and the market was becoming saturated. Now you've got a whole new, vastly larger market for energy storage developing and you're going to get that cumulative doubling of volume happening again now. And so you're going to start seeing the price of bat lithium ion go down. Plus there's such a huge premium uh, energy storage ha has, is so valuable. I mean, it's like the, it's so fundamental to our lives because energy can be turned into almost anything. And so, uh, you know, uh, it, it, energy storage is like the, uh, it's, it's going to continue to go down and it's one of the most important things that h humans can work on. Yeah. Well, thank you, Bert. Right, thank you. Okay, so for next week, we have Yanir Banyam, president and founder of the New England Complex System Institute. He'll give a talk on what is the world coming to from energy systems to global crisis analysis and response. So please join us then, and thank you for coming.